Hello and welcome to the Ark Woman podcast. This is an exploration of womankind. Here we discuss what it is to be a woman in the modern world while utilizing ancient and modern modalities in tandem to create a bounty of health for the body, mind and spirit. G'day everyone and welcome back to the pod. Thanks for joining us again. Today I'm interviewing the incredible Andy Lucas. Andy Lucas has been on the pod before and we were talking about male fertility and today he's back to discuss his new book, Blood Chemistry. This is a fantastic book because we have all had the experience of going and getting our bloods done by our GP, going back to said GP and said GP saying, it's totally fine. Your bloods are totally normal and you're fully healthy and everything is fine and you leave feeling gaslit as fuck knowing that something is wrong (laughs) and not knowing what and not actually having the knowledge to decipher what your bloods actually are enter andy lucas's incredible new book we are going to go through all eight chapters and go through all of the 50 markers or most of the 50 markers in detail specific to women's health and the trends that we're seeing in women's health at the moment so you can look at your bloods alongside this book and go to your doctor and if they're telling you everything's fine when nothing is fine, you can eloquently tell them to get fucked. Enjoy the pod. Hey, Andy, how are you going? I'm good. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm great. I loved your book. We were just starting to talk about it and I was like, let's just start recording now because I loved the book. I read it yesterday. I have the ebook version. It's so detailed, so simple. I feel like anyone could use this. Can you talk about like what inspired you to actually write this book with, I think it's Dr. What's her name? Sorry. Dr. Miranda Miles. Not D- Dr. Miranda Miles. She's awesome as well. Yeah, so speaking of Miranda, like uh, just to introduce her as well, um, she's my old uh, nutritional biochemistry lecturer. And wow. I started working with her when I graduated a few years ago and she's an absolute brain and a lovely woman to boot, uh, very big in the women's health space, obviously, as you know, um, and an absolute pleasure to work with. So Regarding kind of how the book came about, though, it was, it was very interesting when we we're studying some of this stuff at university. We realized there's very minimal text out there for students, health practitioners around what is actually considered optimal in terms of blood chemistry. Um, there's a lot of medical tests, uh, text, obviously, that kind of talk about these types of things. But the way the medical industry looks at it, blood chemistry is very different to how we as natural health practitioners look at it when we're actually trying to achieve optimal health. Um, I mean, there's a couple of great texts out there. Dick and Weatherby wrote one, James LaVar wrote one, but these texts are, you know, 10 plus years old. And and they are dense. Like to actually find what you're yeah. looking for, it's you're sitting there for hours flicking through like the the value, like the, I remember going through the back of these textbooks trying to find, okay, but like where is blood glucose? Where is fasting insulin? Like where exactly is it? And it's just like in the middle of some obscure chapter somewhere and you're like ah oh, this is so difficult <laughs> like yeah and the, the reality is they're they're based on us so realistically being here in australia like the, there's the difference between the us ranges and the international standards so basically yeah it just kind of came about in a way there wasn't much out there i found myself constantly referring back to old notes and i just started to kind of piece one together and it's like it, this is a really good idea to actually put something out there to market mm. because I can only assume I'm not the only one in this situation where it's trying to understand blood chemistry. And, you know, especially when you're in the learning phase, like having a nice little reference was, it just makes it a lot easier. And realistically, I refer back to it all the time, even when I'm working with clients these days. So yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of how it came about. And um, yeah, it's been a great success so far. So we're really happy with what we came out with. I'm really happy that you've created this and I'm going to be using it in my practice as well. I've already found it very, very useful. I've had a few people send over bloods to me this morning and used it and was like, oh my goodness, like this is such a great tool for anyone. I hope doctors use it as well because let's go into that. Like what are your main issues with how we currently formulate so-called healthy blood reference ranges? And before we start that, what is a blood reference range and what is a blood test? Just before we get into this, because like, not a lot of people are going to know what this is. I don't think a lot of people have actually went and got their bloods done and they actually don't even know what a reference value is or a reference range is. Yeah. So I guess in terms of obviously what a blood test is, a lot of the time when you present to the GP and you've got some form of health issue, uh, a lot of times they'll often prescribe you to go and get blood tests done. So obviously they're drawing blood from your body. They're sending it off to a lab. The lab analyzes where your blood fits or the different markers within your blood, depending on the test they're running. Now, in regards to the reference ranges there, the reference ranges are basically set by the medical industry 
in regards to what they consider either they're looking for illness and disease. So it's a very broad range where, for example, I always use the example of like white blood cells, which are your immune system. Now, the medical range is 4 and 11, which is quite a broad range. And the problem is the amount of people that we see, and I'm sure you deal with it as well, that present with blood tests and they'll go and see the GP. The GP will test their bloods, they'll get the results, and the GP will sit there and say, oh, your bloods are fine. And, but you're sitting there shaking your head because you still feel terrible. You've yeah. got these symptoms, you've got no energy, mental health is suffering, whatever it is. And you still know something's wrong. But according to the, the results that the GP said, everything's fine. The gaslighting. The gaslighting is insane. I feel terrible. I feel like I'm dying inside. And your doctor's like, yeah, it's fine. He's like, no, it's not. Something is wrong here. Like, listen to me. And they're like, no, but the reference values are fine. So is there something wrong with our reference values and how we're collecting our reference values? Yeah, in a, in a way I'd say there is because it just depends how you're looking at from because I don't like to rag on the medical industry too much because they I generally believe all their hearts in the right place. Um, but the example I give is myself. Realistically, uh, 15 years ago when I, I travelled overseas for four or five months, I'd come back and I was just a shell of myself. I could barely get out of bed. I was completely exhausted. You know, I was chronically getting ill. I went and got my blood tests and when we refer back to that medical reference range of the immune system, sort of the white blood cells, and we said the medical range is between 4 and 11, my markers were coming in at 3.8. So I was on the low end of the medical range, but the GP just said to me, look, Andy, I'll look, just rest, recover, take some time off, we'll retest these in a couple of weeks. So I retested in two weeks and I came back at 3.9. Wow. And once again, he's like, well, there's not much we can do. Look, we'll just retest in about a month. And... That was basically it. Now, I later found out down the track that um, I'd had a really nasty bout of glandular fever, which, of course, had massively implicated my immune system and I'd done nothing to fix it. So it was one of those things where I not became disillusioned with the medical system but realised it was something that wasn't working. Yes. So if we talk about why or kind of how the medical ranges work, from basically from my perspective these days is what you find is... As I said before, the medical references, they're looking for disease and illness. So if you don't fit within, oh, sorry, if you fit within their range, they consider you healthy. The problem is these reference ranges are based off, for example, say they take a thousand people at random from the population. Now they'll do the old uh, bell curve. If you fit within the 95 percentile, then you are considered healthy. It's the 5% of outliers that are, they base their ranges off. The problem is if you look out to the streets today, how many of that 95% are actually healthy? And I can assure you it's a very small 20%, percentage. 20%, maybe 15 if you're in a nice neighbourhood. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, good food supply, uh, food supply, quality water, sunshine, you know, and you look at the world today and it's just not a healthy place to live in. So what we're finding very much so is people are going to the GPs, they're getting their blood tested, they're told that their blood results are fine, they're becoming disillusioned. They're coming to see practitioners like us who are they're looking for more answers. And when you start to dig into it and realise that those ranges are actually not conducive to good health, then all of a sudden you start to understand and you can start to pinpoint what's really going wrong with someone internally. Mm. So what we've done with this book is very much collate what we consider optimal ranges based off a lot of research, a lot of studies, and you'll find the ranges, for example, are a lot smaller. I go back to the, the white blood cells between medical range between four and 11. Our optimal range is actually between seven and a half and five and a half. So you'll notice that's a much smaller window. So effectively what I'm doing from that instance, if you're sitting outside that five and a half to seven and a half range, I'm putting a flag on that. Then I'm correlating that with all the other markers that might be in or out of range to look for trends to see what's going on and what might be leading towards this immune dysfunction all might explain why you're actually feeling the way you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And from that, you can effectively start to really help someone. And your book is fantastic because in the book, it, for those of you that will buy it, hopefully everyone will, um, it's fantastic because it has the low and then the high value and the, the, and, you know, the disease and the disorders that are associated with this. So you might see anemia with you know, low vitamin D and low vitamin B, and that's showing you what systems in the body might be off. And it's giving you clues 
for what you should be focusing on and what what diagnosis you might be heading towards. And I did notice that, like I, I noticed that over and over and over again, that the reference values that were medicinal um, by the allopathic system were, you know, yours were pro- like yours were probably just a squidge in between and sometimes they're a little bit higher and sometimes they're a little bit lower. And yeah, I just want to go in chapter by chapter. How many chapters are there? And you go through different systems of the body. Oh, that's eight. a really good question. I think there's eight or nine chapters. I should know that. I know there's about <laughs> eight or nine chapters uh, off the yeah, top of my head. We'll go with that. Yeah. But there's 50 reference values you go through specifically that people can get in their bloods. And before we get started, people might want to listen to this podcast and then go, okay, I'm going to go get my bloods done. How do people in Australia go and get their bloods done? Like what is the pathway to going and getting a full blood panel and what would you recommend people ask for? Okay, so with this one, the the standard way to go and get this done is obviously through the GP. Uh, and this is what I generally recommend people to try first. Um, if you go and see the GP, you can generally get the large majority of this stuff bulk built. Now, when you go and see a GP, GPs they have to justify all this stuff to Medicare, which I think is ridiculous. I honestly believe someone, we should be able to get access to a full blood panel every 12 months in terms of just being able to prevent things before they pop up. But we have to work. We live in reality, right? So like I said, the GPs need to justify their tests to Medicare. So generally what I say when I'm working with a client before they go and see their GP is basically just in a strange way, forgive me for saying this, but play up your symptoms a little bit and sit there and say, look, I've been feeling really fatigued. My libido's crashed. I'm super depleted. And then just kind of talk about how you're just feeling a little bit worse for wear because they need to justify it, right? So basically once you do that, they're more. it might be more likely to get them to be able to do all the tests. Otherwise, what you can do, um, alternative health practitioners, we have the capacity to run tests privately, which do mean does mean you'll be out of pocket for the tests. And depending on the full panel that you get done, that can be anywhere between three to five hundred dollars so it is an expense but it's money well invested because we're talking health long term right you know it's far easier to kind of catch something early spend a little bit of money correcting nutrition diet lifestyle then five years down the track dealing with disease and being on medication for the rest of your life so but i mean one of the things that i found is like most gps will run they'll run the majority of like they'll probably run about 80 percent of the tests that i'd refer to and i'll go through those in a second but then what you can do is always do, if there's a couple of tests that are missing, you can always just run those tests privately and they'll range from kind of somewhere between 10 to $50 each per test. So you might spend an extra $100 just to get the top up of what you need, but it's well worth it because sometimes you can be missing very valuable information from just having one test not in the list as opposed to everything else. Mm. Um, but regarding specifically what we're looking at, you know, we're looking at a full blood panel. So we're looking at red cells, white cells. We're looking at kidney markers, liver markers, cholesterol markers, uh, iron studies, thyroid studies, which generally most GPs will struggle to bulk fill. Um, so that's one that I tend to refer out quite a bit. We're also looking at basic minerals, um, you know, magnesium, zinc, B vitamins, vitamin D, etc. cetera. Um, I think I mentioned cholesterol. Also, too, inflammation markers is a big one that I want to get tested with a lot of clients, you know, uh, C-reactive protein, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, uh, because that gives a really good indication of what's happening within the body in an inflammatory state. Um, and also, two sex hormones. Um, and I will mention that, obviously, this, this initial copy of the book doesn't contain sex or thyroid hormones in it. That is coming in a later edition. But they are definitely things that we would recommend um, to get tested, and especially yourself, so if you're working with a lot of women, they, they are very important tests to get done. And that's a question I get from women all the time is because our sex hormones change quite significantly and a lot of the time doctors are like, oh, let's just put you in whenever. And it's like, well, I don't think that makes total sense because, you know, luteinizing hormone, progesterone and estrogen are going and even testosterone, oxytocin will cycle through. So if you wanted women to go and look at sex hormones, what would you recommend doing two different panels at different times? Or like how would you recommend women go about that if sex hormones is something they want to look at? And forgive you not, not, for not having the specifics on me at this point in time, but generally what I'd say is there are certain dates in certain for certain hormones that you want to test relative to your cycle. Yes. You know, whether that's at peak ovulation or whether that's two or three days after after the bleed begins. Um, that's when you want to get these tests done. So you can still get a full panel done, but you might speak to your GP and say, well, look, if, look, if a GP knows what they're doing, they'll tell you when to get these tests done at the right time. 
if they're not, then, okay, get your blood test, speak to someone different. So if you think you're low in progesterone, get it when progesterone will be at its most dominant, vice versa for luteinizing hormone and estrogen as well. Yeah. And also to make sure you record where you are on your date of cycle. So when we are analyzing these tests, we can also make sure we're referring back to certain ranges because, as you said, a lot of female hormones will fluctuate throughout the cycle. And if we don't know which day you are on, mm-hmm. then we can't make an actual accurate analysis of kind of where these levels are at. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's get started. I wanted to go through each chapter of your book and I wanted to ask you a few questions about each. I, like I have so many more questions I wanted to ask. Like my, <laughs> I was reading your book yesterday and I had like an A4 notebook and I had about four pages filled of questions just because I was like, this is so fascinating. Um, I love blood work so much and I love this book so much, but I've I've whittled it down to two pages. (laughs) So let's get started. All right, so let's start with red blood cell accounts. What would women look for in red blood cell counts? Specifically, what are some general trends that you see in blood work from women? Um. Especially one of the big, just in general with women, one thing that I see a lot of is very much depletion. You tend to see a lot of the ranges on the lower end of the scale. Um, and a lot of that does come back to nutritional impact, which probably from a female perspective, the information we've been taught for years is, you know, eat less, move more, you'll be healthy, you'll be skinny, which is complete and utter bollocks. Yeah. Um, what we need to be looking at is, you know, calorie intake is very much relative to caloric demand. So, you know, the more you're doing, the more stress you are, the more minerals and nutrients you need. Because the problem is if you're not eating enough, then you're going to impact hormonal production. You're going to impact the development of red and white blood cells. It's going to impact your immune system. So, yeah, generally what we see from in general kind of trends, like I'd see low white blood cells, uh, low red blood cells, um, hemoglobin count is specifically low. I know a lot of women tend to run on coffee, which mm-hmm. will impact these types of things from a negative standpoint. So I, I guess relative to that, the whole depletion cycle, which I'm sure we'll get further into as we go into these questions, it's yeah. just something that I see time and time again. Yeah. Oh, so sad when you see that, when you see blood work and you're like, oh, wow, this woman is so depleted and she's probably just like, what's wrong with me? And all the science is really quite pervasive and tells us that we should just be acting like a little man and that we should be able to do the, you know, the F45 and eat vegan and, you know, drink coffee every morning. But obviously that's affecting our blood work and our blood specifically, I would say, pretty hardcore. So the next one I, is, I think is quite interesting because women have the highest percentage of autoimmune disorders. Should women, women with these disorders get blood work done focusing on white blood cell counts such as neutrophils and monocytes, for example? Yeah, so any blood panel that gets done, you, you should definitely be getting your red and white cell count. Um, the white cell count is one of the most important markers that I look at in terms of how much information it gives me. Mm-hmm. So when we're talking about things like uh, autoimmune conditions, now, as most people are aware, or if they're not aware, a lot of autoimmunity can be linked back to gut, to the gut. Now, when there's degradation in the gut cells, when there's intestinal permeability, so poor leaky gut, what happens is the immune cells become overactive in an attempt to fight off what excess toxins, chemicals, pollutants, whatever the body, what, whatever's put into the body. Now, what we tend to find is uh, you'll see initially there's an acute response where your or your total white cells will increase but over time the body basically can't keep up production if it's constantly fighting like i like to use the analogy of the the white blood cell the immune system in general it's like an army fighting a war when it first go to war it just throws as many troops at it as possible in the hope that it can knock it off now the problem is if it can't knock it off you start to run out of troops to fight the war Mm. and then all of a sudden for example your neutrophils and your lymphocytes are more your basic kind of soldiers that can fight off the standard kind of illnesses and disease. Now, when you're dealing with more specific bacteria or conditions like autoimmunity, what happens is the standard blood cells, the neutrophils and lymphocytes can't win the war. So that's when the monocytes, the sonophils and basophils start to come out almost like special forces to try and fight whatever is going on in the body. So you can see from blood work what stage of autoimmunity or gut degradation a woman is up to and you can figure out, okay, this is where we're at and this is what we need to do from that, from seeing how many basophils and neutrophils and monocytes are hanging around? 
Yeah, so in, in a way, yes. So you won't see the specific condition, obviously, yeah. but what you will get is a strong indication that there is something going on. Now, generally when I see these indications, especially if we're dealing with something like autoimmunity, if you've got elevated eosinophils, basophils, monocytes, one of the first port of calls is like, all right, we need to dig deeper to find out what's going on in the gastrointestinal system. So we need to know effectively what's happening within the gut. Now, is there intestinal permeability? Is there elevated uh, beta-glucuronidase? Is there digestive enzymes that are suffering? What kind of bacterial and parasitic makeup is within your gut? You know, how is your microbiome being affected? Because if you can see this information, then you can start to work more specifically on correcting what's going on at a gut level. And when you fix the gut, then you fix the immune system. Mm -hmm. so I have a few questions about that. So number one, if, if you saw blood work come back and it, and it had high white blood cell count, that would be conducive to some, some leaky gut or some gut permeability issue, would you recommend a, um, a stool test and looking at the microbiome and looking at the other markers in a stool test as well? Yeah, generally that's what would happen. So if you'll generally find with people with uh, severe gastrointestinal issues, their overall white cell count will be low, but the specialised the monocytes, eosinophils and basophils will be high. Okay. Now that basically indicates that the body's been fighting this for a while. If you're seeing just a white cell count that's high and the, the specialised the monocytes, sonophils and basophils are, are low, my first question is, have you been sick in the last couple of weeks? You know, the body's probably just fighting off some kind of virus. Mm -hmm. So but once you kind of get that indication, okay, yes, they're chronically low, the specialised forces are high, okay, then we do need to go and do some further investigation. That's where something like stool testing kind of really comes into play. Okay. So what would you recommend for high versus low, generally, white blood cell count? So say if a woman got a, you know, a blood work done and she had high white blood cells versus low, what would you recommend from a nutrient profile to correct this issue? So if we're trying to support the immune system in general, um, basic minerals uh, such as zinc and vitamin C, like everybody knows, they're super important for immune health. Um, one, thing, one thing that I really encourage is uh, omega-3s. Omega-3s are super essential for helping heal the cells. You know, every one of our cells is made up of lipid membrane. We need good quality lipids, fats, to actually help heal these cells, which protect the body from all these toxins and chemicals and viruses, for example. But then there's other things, like if there's some kind of gastrointestinal concern going on and there's chronic inflammation in the gut, something like a curcumin is incredibly powerful for reducing inflammation, um, especially something also like quercetin, which is actually really good to help deal with high levels of histamine in the blood. You know, those types of things can be really, really beneficial. Just a quick shout out to our sponsors, Creation Cacao. Creation Cacao is an organic ceremonial cacao company and they are passionate about making sure that you guys have the highest quality cacao in your cabinet. If you know me, you know I love cacao. I have it every day or every other day if I'm not having a matcha and I found it incredible for my health. I don't really lean into coffee so much anymore because I'd rather have a high fat, high nutrient dense, high mineral, delicious drink, which is cacao. If you use the discount code ARCORMAN10 at their website, which you'll find in the show notes, you'll get 10% off any order from Creation Cacao. Okay, amazing. So let's move on to blood sugar balance, which I think has also all of these things we're talking about are having a moment in social media health spheres at the moment there's lots of misinformation about a lot of the things that you clarify in this book which i love this book for because it just made everything so simple so blood sugar balance can you briefly expl explain how blood sugar massively impacts women's hormonal health throughout the cycle and how it can impact different you know sex hormones specifically if you wanted to go down that route yeah so regarding blood sugar i will quickly touch on some of the basics you know it's most people know that having a stable blood sugar, having regular blood sugar levels is super important to simple things like uh, weight gain, thyroid function, energy production. And what you tend to find when people aren't eating consistent, high quality nutrients throughout the day, these levels become impacted. Now, what happens based off that, if we're moving into more of a women's health kind of sphere, effectively, when you have elevated levels of something like insulin, for example, it leads to excess androgen production. Yeah. So that's going to lead to increased levels of testosterone. Now, from a female perspective, yes, females want X amount of testosterone, but they want much more estrogen. Now, you want to flip the scale in terms of men. You know, we want high levels of testosterone, but lower levels of estrogen. You know, they both have, a, both have their place and their roles within the body. Now, what you tend to see when women 
up, have high levels of insulin are things like uh, polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome, yes. which is really, really common. Now that's associated strongly with increased levels of testosterone. Mm-hmm. You know, so one of the other things you're likely to see too is uh, when you've got that kind of hormonal balance out of whack, you know, too much testosterone, not enough estrogen, that's going to mess with your menstrual cycle as well which can lead to much further things down the track. You know, irregular periods can obviously lead to fertility issues further down the track. So it's super important that blood sugar is actually balanced and in within ratios because from a female health perspective, because women are more sensitive in regarding to their hormonal balance, if that's out of whack, it can have massive implications on things like this moving forward. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you for going into PCOS because I think it is so interesting how we talk about PCOS and how it is changing at the moment because people understand PCOS as a purely reproductive disorder and absolutely isn't. It is a metabolic disorder that neg- negatively affects the hormonal system and, and the endocrine system. And I didn't actually understand the root of how that came, kind of came about biochemically in the body. Thanks for explaining that. So when we're looking at blood glucose, we're going to be looking at blood fasting blood glu- glucose in a blood test. So how does high and low blood glucose for a woman's hormonal health affect women? So in terms of fasting blood glucose, now that one tends to, that can be manipulated quite well in terms of, from a nutritional standpoint, so if it's high or low, it it generally resolves with a quality diet can be implicated or sorry, can be corrected quite easily. So I guess one of the bigger questions, and I think it was one of, we spoke about this earlier, is... In a way, it's kind of linked with insulin as well. So what I might kind of look at, one of the big things that I look at, I look more at the insulin levels relative to women's health. So, for example, if a woman's got low insulin levels, that, if you're not aware, like a lot of clients might not be, insulin is very much involved in signaling the ovaries to release eggs during ovulation. Yes. So if you have low insulin, that's going to inhibit that egg release, which is going to basically... One that's going to have massive implications on fertility. It's going to lead to decreased levels of sex hormone production, which, you know, as we know in today's world, a lot of women are really struggling to conceive these days. Now, I'm the first person to, I'm not going to sit there and put it on women because men have just a bigger role to play in this as women do. You know, most of the statistics out there will sit there and say it's one third female issues, one third male issues, and the rest is a combination or a combination of unknown factors. So it's 50-50 play here for both of us. So we both need to be looking after ourselves here. Yes. But speaking specifically with women, low insulin levels, once again, PCOS become, can become an issue here. I mean, it's indicated with both high and low insulin levels. So this is where we, we always talk about ratio and balance. Like it's super important that when we have these imbalances, especially in something like insulin, we need to correct this especially if you're looking to conceive. Um, Mm -hmm. What I will say is when we're talking about high insulin levels, like that is very much indicated with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Yes. So blood sugar regulation for women is super, super essential, uh, blood sugar and also blood insulin levels. Um, But if someone's got high levels of insulin, they're going to be very estrogen dominant as well. And this is going to lead to mood swings, irregular periods, uh, PMS, all these types of symptoms, which are going to have a massive implication on just how a woman feels, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, and these are things that like, you know, a couple hundred years ago before the world became incredibly toxic, you know, women didn't really have to deal with too much of this at all. You know, it was, it was just not really an issue. But These are modern issues, yeah, for sure. Like I talk to my mum about this all the time. She can't believe how sick modern women are. She's like, you're young, you should all be so healthy. We didn't have any of this. You know, they're all smoking and drinking and partying and carrying on. And, you know, now we have this generation of people who are obsessed with their health and they couldn't be sicker because we live in an environment that is just so toxic. So how can you, so if someone, if a woman has a low blood glucose and a, or low insulin versus high, what would you recommend to equalize both of these problems out? So specifically if something's low in regarding to blood sugar and insulin, we need to look at nutritional factors. You know, are they consuming enough? Are they on these specific types of diet? Are they getting the minerals and nutrients that they need? Um, generally, you'll only ever see low insulin levels in people that are probably on the too lean of the equation. Yeah. Um, and then on the flip scale, high insulin levels, you'll see high insulin levels in um, people that are in, in, they don't look like they're healthy, they're in good shape. Like I dealt with a client the other day who, might have been carrying an extra five kilos than what he should be, but he had a fasting insulin level of 39. Now, you know, I've got another client who's 140 kilos and he's got a fasting insulin level of 29. Yeah, okay. I was just like, whoa, okay, 
So a lot of dietary and stress factors kind of play in this. And the guy that I was speaking about with the 39 level, you know, he'd been through some very, very stressful period over the last few years, drunk too much, eating absolute crap, but because he was active, managed to keep his weight at bay. So from that perspective, like a high insulin, high blood sugar, when I look at that, I'm sitting there looking at, okay, what are you eating? Are you moving? What is your lifestyle like? Low insulin levels and low blood glucose, I'm sitting there going, are you getting enough? Are you consuming enough of the right things? Because it looks like your body's running in a depleted state. Mm. And I think stress has a lot to do with that as well. As much as I love and kind of dislike a few of the things that Dr. Mindy Peltz stands for, she told this story about how she had a continuous glucose monitor and insulin monitor on her. She had a fight with her daughter and she was in, you know, she, she was doing a 72-hour fast, so she was completely fasted. She had high ketones, all the rest of it. And she looked at her on her app later on after she had this fight and her insulin went through the roof, her blood sugar went through the roof. So you could be eating correctly, you can be eating and, and exercising and doing all the things correctly. But if you're stressed out, your blood sugar and your insulin is still going to be negatively impacted and you'll still have these negative impacts on hormones. It's crazy how much stress can impact these uh, results too. I'm personally, like I had a test, I had a big fight with an ex-partner many years ago and I had my blood test taken the next day. And my white cell clown had crashed to like 2.8. Wow. Wow. I got it retested two weeks later because we were worried and it was back up to, uh, look, I naturally have a lower white blood cell count because of some factors in my life in the past. But um, from that perspective, like it dropped massively just based off that one fight. So there is something to the hippy dippy sphere that says, you know, energy in motion, like these things do absolutely have an effect on the biochemistry and the physical nature of our bodies for sure. Yeah. And looking at things like, you know, if you've been exposed to illnesses, disease, chronic stress over a long period of time, you know, for my instance, chronic stress has been a big thing throughout my adult life. Mm. That's what smashed my white blood cell count on my immune system function. Mm -hmm. Now, no matter what I did to kind of the only way to kind of really correct some of these things, if you're not dealing with the underlying stresses, then you can do everything from a nutritional standpoint, from a, you can eat the right food, you can exercise and move the right way. But if that chronic stress is always there, there's always going to be a problem. So yeah. as you know, from women's health perspective, chronic stress is a massive issue Huge. Um, that we need to take into consideration when we're getting these things done. Mm, yep. Yep, and it sounds so cachet to say all the time, oh, are you stressed and almost in, you know, you probably see this for your clients as well and you bring up just the word, you know, people are like, oh, like, yeah, I'm stressed, everyone's stressed out, but we don't actually realise how it can negatively impact our health and I guess you, you've, you've specialised in men's health and probably fertility as well and that's probably something you have to talk about with every single one of your clients and I feel the same as well. So while we're on that, what are some things that you would recommend for men and women to de decrease the amount of stress in the body. Well, stress is a it's a it's a how to say it's a it's a multi prong kind of equation because there's a multitude of different stresses out there that we're dealing with, whether it's physical stress, nutritional stress, emotional stress, uh, lifestyle stress. But what I will say is the human body, at a biochemical level, doesn't differentiate differentiate between these types of stresses. It's all one stress. So we need to basically, and this is the beauty of blood chemistry, you can start to see how this chronic stress is manifesting at a biochemical level mm -hmm. and address it accordingly. One of the big things that I see quite commonly is simply most people are running on a very depleted state. You know, their, their stress output is up here, their nutritional intake is in here, so their bodies are chasing their own tail. So what happens is the body can turn catabolic and start to break down its own tissues to find the minerals and nutrients it requires to keep us functioning at somewhat of a somewhat of a functional level i guess yeah. now if you don't correct that imbalance you can give every supplement or make every lifestyle change under the sun but if you're not getting the minerals and nutrients you need the body's never going to be able to fight the stress at a chronic sorry at a biochemical level and you're going to be forever stuck in this chronic cycle of stress yeah. so yeah from my perspective like i said we we really need to take that into consideration and i think one of the biggest things with stress is there's certain stresses we can control and certain ones we can't. Yeah. We control what goes into our body. That's one of the first things we can address. Now, if we control what we put into our body, is that going to fix everything overnight? No, but will it help correct a few of the other imbalances yes. over time? Of course, it definitely will. Yeah. So we can address it at a slowly get the body back onto that kind of anabolic cycle where it's starting to heal itself. So it's producing more energy. So when you're dealing with a stressful situation, guess what? You can cope with it because you haven't got a million things running in your mind elsewhere. 
Mm. All right, thank you for that. So the next chapter of your book focuses on electrolytes. And before we go deeper into this, can you please explain briefly what an electrolyte actually is? Because we hear this word a lot and I don't think people actually understand what it means and what electrolytes are and what their function in the body actually is. Yeah, so I guess the best way to look at electrolytes, and we've all heard the word, you know, everyone talks about uh, you get some electrolytes, I'll go and have a Gatorade and you'll be fine. <laughs> um, when we're looking at electrolytes, we're looking at things like sodium, potassium, bicarbonate, um, chloride. Now, these are all essential minerals that once upon a time we used to get in our water because we used to drink water from the streams, which would leach these minerals off the rocks. Now, what these electrolytes actually do is they actually help to move things in and out of the cells within the body. So from a cellular health perspective, they are super, super essential. So you can drink two litres of tap water a day, which has got nothing but outside of the crap in there. It's got nothing in the way of electrolytes in there. So you can have plenty of water in the body, but unless you've got these electrolytes, which you do get from things like, uh, you can get from calcium sea salt, lemon lime, they contain a lot of these minerals, uh, electrolytes as well. They actually hydrate the body at a cellular level, which assist with, you know, producing energy, moving minerals in and out to kind of keep us healthy and keep us functioning at our best. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, electrolyte balance is super, super essential. And it's a lot of people who do not take into consideration, you know, they think they drink their two litres of water a day and they think they're hydrated, but they're not because their body can't actually... Tab water is the devil. I always make posts on my Instagram about this, about how we need to really make sure we're getting water from a good source because otherwise you're going to be you're going to be dehydrating yourself. I think people are just drinking tap water all the time or at least unfiltered tap water from, you know, municipal water sources and they are just dehydrating themselves and leaching themselves of minerals over and over and over again. And to be honest with you, that's something that I see quite commonly throughout people's blood is dehydration. Because um, once again, once when you talk about that stress impact, like the more we're doing, the more our body's functioning, the more hydrated we need to be because we're going to burn through this stuff. Mm. So you're generally seeing a lot of, especially in, um, I guess, in the the older population that have been chronically stressed for a long period of time, you know, the corporate types that are working 10, 12 hour days and then they're turning to the weekend warriors and they go and smash themselves at CrossFit for two or three days of the week. And then, <laughs> yeah, it, it's very, very common. And I swear, like the amount of times that I've recommended people go and walk, uh, get their own water filters like I should be getting some kind of kickback for one of the companies that I refer <laughs> to because I reckon I've sold them at least 50 or 60 uh, water filters just through clientele in the past. <laughs> You'd be a Kangan water affiliate before you know it. <laughs> okay, so what electrolytes are the key for in your book and do you think women should keep an eye on a few of them? Like what do you usually see in blood work from women in, you know, with electrolyte balance in the blood? Um, look, and in terms of importance, like sodium and potassium are probably the two of the first ones that I always go to. Like they all, in terms of importance, I believe they've, they've all got importance. Like everything is in balance for a reason. It's got a role. But in terms of what we can really, most people understand, you know, sodium is generally where we get, we get that from salt, not from, ta oh, you can get it from table salt, but it's terrible. And don't get it from table salt. Yeah. But Celtic sea salt, Himalayan pink salt, um, because sodium and potassium effectively, they work synergistically in terms of fluid balance within the body. So they very much what help to shuttle things in and out of the cell. So if this is out of alignment from a cellular hydration perspective, that's going to be negatively impacted. Mm -hmm. What you tend to see is um, people tend to be lower in the sodium equation these days because they're not getting enough. You know, people believe salt is bad. Mm -hmm. Table salt is bad. Mineralized salt is incredibly good because that's where we actually get these electrolytes from. So, like a little bit, putting a little bit of a pinch of um, sea salt or uh, pink salt into your water is actually a great way to create a natural electrolyte. Yeah. Um, but also, too, like calcium, when we'll talk about calcium a little bit later when we get to if we're talking about minerals, but from a bone health and osteoporosis perspective, once again, that is super, super essential that we're getting levels of this into the body. And we get this through our water as well, not just through food, because for women specifically, we do know that bone health is super important, especially once they start to go through menopause. And if they're depleted in these electrolytes, you know, sodium, potassium, calcium, bicarb, um, chlorine, for example, then that's going to have a massive implication, not just at a cellular level, but from a hydration and energy production level, but also in bone health. So, Okay, awesome. 
So statistically, three quarters of women are, or three quarters of all vegan and vegetarian people are women. And I noticed in your book a few of the of the warning signs um, with low and deficient values in this book was associated with a vegan and vegetarian diet. So women also have a far more likely chance of eating low amounts of protein. So can you please speak to how these diet choices can show up in our kidney markers specifically? Yeah, so I'm a big advocate against the vegetarian and vegan diet. My, mm -hmm. I'll give you very quickly give my stance is, in all honesty, like I know the large majority of vegetarians and vegans, they feel fantastic for the first two or three months because effectively they're loading their bodies with minerals and nutrients and vitamins that they weren't getting otherwise. They're increasing the levels of fiber. So all of a sudden what happens is they start to feel a lot better because the body's clearing a lot of waste out. But what happens is when they run vegetarian vegan diets, over a period of time, the body starts to run into a state of depletion because they're not getting the, the minerals, the nutrients, the amino acids they require to actually heal and restore the body at a cellular and a muscular level. So regarding kidney function specifically, what you tend to see is um, signs of malnutrition. So low urea, for example, to me, straight off the bat, that, that's definitely an indication of low or malnutrition. The body's not getting enough protein. Now, you can still have protein in your diet and still be malnourished because, once again, we go back to that stress equation. If you're highly stressed, your protein demand is going to massively increase. If you're training as well, if you're lifting weights, if you're working on the tools, if you're working an active job, your demand for amino acids to repair the muscle tissue that you're breaking down throughout the day is going to be incredibly elevated. So protein, for example, protein intake becomes really, really important. Now, can you get protein from vegetarian and vegan sources? Yes. Is it as bioavailable? No. And that's what people need to remember. So if you're training and then go and have a plant-based diet afterwards, it's going to take a lot longer for those proteins to be kind of utilized by the body to get or start that repair process as opposed to, you know, animal proteins, which it's ready to go as soon as we consume it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other markers that we want to look for is low creatinine. Now, this is very much indicated with uh, large amounts of muscle wastage. So once again, if you're not getting those proteins back into the diet to support kidney function, to pour, support muscle repair, what happens is the body over time will start to break down the muscle tissue because muscle is very dense in minerals and nutrients, but it needs these minerals and nutrients to keep us alive. It's more important to be alive than have big muscles. Yes. <laughs> or, for example, and you, you watch Survivor. You, you see what happens to these people when they become starved. They, even the muscular guys, like they lose so much in the way of muscle tissue very quickly mm -hmm. because their bodies just don't have enough to repair themselves. And the muscle wastage is incredibly high because it's so dense. So when you're running a vegetarian and vegan diet, for a long period of time that's one of the things that we really kind of you just see it very very clearly mm. if you love your tonics and your medicinal mushrooms and you like things all organic and australian made and owned you are going to fucking love super feast super feast is a family-owned australian company supplying the best tonics and medicinal mushrooms in the world experience the magic of the i am gaia blend a personal favorite specifically made for female health you can use the code aquaman10 for 10 percent off any product at superfeast.com.au okay i have so many questions about all of the chapters but i just want to go through each one lightly <laughs> so we're not here for hours and hours so we'll <laughs> so let's move on to the liver which takes a huge hit with women specifically who are on birth the birth control and even the copper iud which increases estrogen in the system so what blood markers would you look out for with women specifically on hormonal birth control pills yeah so specifically in terms of what actually happens we're looking at the, the hormonal birth control does a lot of damage to the body at a cellular level now this leads to increased levels of inflammation when the cells become damaged, which what happens is in you'll see in terms of liver markers specifically, ALT and ALC, when they become elevated, that's very much an indication that there's some form of liver damage or inflammation within the system. The liver is producing more of these enzymes to help kind of fight what's going on. So when I see ALT and AST elevate, I'm just like, okay, straight off the bat, we need to look at what's causing this damage to the liver. Now, for example, the hormonal birth, birth control, the contraceptive pill, for example, that is a strong indicator that you'll see elevated levels here. ALP, which is um, alkaline phosphate or phosphatase, um, 
you tend to see lower in most people, and that's generally because of a malnourished thing. Now, as we know, any form of medication that we take does rob the body of minerals and nutrients too. So you're likely to generally see a little bit lower in ALP, but AST, ALT, they're going to be higher. Now, one of the other liver markers that's worth kind of mentioning relative to this is bilirubin. Now, that generally is designed to mobilize bile and excrete from the system. Now, you're likely to see an increase of levels of bilirubin in the system because the liver isn't able to clear this stuff as efficiently. So obviously, if there's damage to the liver from something like hormonal birth control, that's going to impact bilirubin metabolism as well, which is going to lead to in, uh, increases in uh, bilirubin levels. Now, one of the ways you tend to see people with high bilirubin count, because bilirubin is like an orangey-brown kind of substance itself, yeah. When you have elevated levels of um, bilirubin, it tends to lead to that little uh, yellowy tinge, that jaundice kind of look. Yes. So if you've got that skin tone, we need to look at what's going on in your liver very, very quickly. Mm. So with women who are experiencing estrogen dominance, what liver markers would you expect to see with like a so-called sluggish liver? We hear about the sluggish liver a lot, but can you please break down what that means and what we would see in blood work with women who have this condition? Yeah, um, this one's a pretty clear one. Uh, generally, what you'll see, once again, you'll see those elevated levels of AST and ALT. Yep. Um, now, effectively, sluggish liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hormonal imbalance, these will very they, these present pretty clearly. Um, like I said, AST and ALT are generally your best markers. Uh, one of the other markers to look out for, especially regarding estrogen dominance, is um, one of the sex hormones which is SHBG or sex hormone binding globulin. Mm -hmm. Now, you tend to see this on the lower end of the scale. Now, SHBG is produced in the liver. So obviously when the liver is sluggish, as you mentioned, that's going to impact the production of something like SHBG, which once again, in a low state is not great. In a high state also is quite negative. So it's, it's very important to understand that the, the re, with the body, human body, everything works in ratios. So the range has become super, super important. So... It's bad if it's low. It can be bad if it's high too and vice versa. And I think that's the thing that we need to wrap our head around is that the body is not acting alone. Like there's no, there's no one marker that acts alone. It has this relationship with, this, with everything around it. And obviously this is what your book goes into, which I think is great. But I think this is something that people need to remember when they're looking at their blood work is that we're not just looking at these singular ranges. They all have a relationship to each other and they all have ratios with lots of different hormones that we are and aren't aware of. I don't think, you know, the science that we have at the moment is incredible and we have more than enough knowledge to heal people out adequately. But this, you know, this notion that we know everything about the human body is just so fucking ridiculous. We absolutely do not know everything. <laughs> There's more that we don't know than what we do know. Um, so moving on, so your book touched on blood protein quite beautifully. Is blood pro protein correlated with protein intake? And what would you usually see associated with high and low blood protein levels? Yeah, okay. So I, I try to make the differential. It's, it's not specifically to protein intake. It's more to do with general overall nutritional intake. Now, when you think about it from that perspective, like, is that linked with high uh, with protein intake? Then of course it is, because protein is probably some of the most nutritionally dense food that we can eat. Now, if you're not consuming proteins, obviously, then from a nutritional standpoint, you're going to be deficient in proteins. So, but it's also relative to it's not just a protein marker. So it's more a generalized kind of I'm not getting enough of everything. Protein is one of the best sources to get it from. It doesn't mean I just need to eat more protein. So relative to kind of specific things like I, I wanted to kind of touch on like I'll kind of go through albumin, then I'll go through goblin and because yeah. they all have different kind of relevances. Now, one of the things with albumin, I should touch base. So let me take it back a step. Yep. Obviously what protein markers in the body, so albumin and globulin, very much transporters of anything and everything around the body. So they are super essential. I do tend to see a lot of people with on the lower end of the spectrum relative to overall protein markers. But as I said, albumin and globulin have slightly different roles. So it's essential to make sure that we know that they're both within range, not just looking at the total protein count. Um, when someone, for example, has low albumin, they're going to look at things like uh, malnutrition is a big thing. So we need to look at, okay, are they eating enough food? Are they getting enough proteins in their diet? Vegetarians and vegans are notorious for having low albumin. Yeah. Um, also, too, liver dysfunction. 
Now, obviously, with these enzymes, uh, these transfers, these proteins, sorry, being produced within the liver, if the liver is not functioning well, that is going to impact their production. Okay. Another fact, oh, excuse me, another factor too, we need to look at uh, gastrointestinal dysfunction. Is there issues with absorption? Is there issues with nutrient breakdown? You know, because all these things will impair the body's capacity to produce albumin. Um, now, if we're looking at something like high levels of albumin, for example, now that can be relative, for example, to elevated levels of protein intake. If you're consuming too much protein and your body's not designed to take in that much, that will lead to something like high albumin. Mm -hmm. Now, definitely not saying the carnivore diet or something like that is bad because it's not. It's always relative to the individual because we're all different. Just because a food looks good on or says it does this or that under a microscope, that doesn't mean once it's within our bodies, it doesn't act differently. You know, one man's food is another man's poison. What I, how much protein I need to eat is very different to how much protein you need to eat. So it's very essential kind of when we're working with this stuff, we need to work, it, you know, it can be a little bit of trial and error to make sure we're finding the balance for what you as an individual needs because ethnicity plays a role, yes. hormone plays a role, yes. our gut microbiome plays a role. Um, but one thing that is very clear with high albumin levels is that dehydration that we spoke about just before. Mm -hmm. so if we're finding high levels of albumin, you know, is the blood moving sufficiently? Is there enough fluid within the body to actually move this stuff around or is it kind of aggregating? Um, then if we talk about globulins now, as we know, globulins have much more of a link with the immune function. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're looking at low levels of globulin, once again, we're looking at malabsorption, the body just not being able to produce enough. Liver dysfunction, once again, plays a role in this. But also, too, this can be very much linked back to autoimmunity and immune deficiencies. If we're low in globulins, you know, immunoglobulins are very, very important for our immune system. Now, is that impacting at an immune function or an immune level? Sorry. Um, when we tend to see high levels of globulin, like, once again, that can be more linked with, okay, this can be very strongly linked with specific kind of autoimmune conditions, for example, like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis because the body's producing excess amount of these immunoglobulins to try and fight off itself. So we're going to see this in high levels. It's not something I see too often, but it's definitely when you do see it, it's like, okay, we need to do some further investigations what's going on. Here. And what are your new fixes for that? So if someone has high or low of these two specific proteins in blood work, what would you recommend to fix either of those issues? Uh, dietary is probably the first protocol, yeah. um, but also too, you need to support liver function. They're probably the two mainstays that I go to first because as a byproduct, if you support liver function, theoretically that should take a lot of stress off the body. Um, you know, a lot of people these days focus heavily on the gut, which is super, super important because we all know the gut is effectively our second brain. It's where it's basically the, the mailing and packaging and sorting system in the body. It does a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But also too, if the liver is under chronic stress, then that's going to impact our body's ability to deal with everything that's going on within the body. So we need very much need to support liver function while we're doing this type of work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of what we need to look at is very much from a nutritional standpoint, what are the things we're missing from our diet? What might we be consuming too much of? Or are we putting in things that are causing further irritation or further liver stress, which is leading to these imbalances? Mm -hmm. And so what would you recommend? Would you like to recommend any herbs or specific vitamins and supplements for supporting the liver specifically? Um, generally what you'd want to do, you want to support, you want to increase an antioxidant intake. So, you know, dark fruits, dark vegetables, much, much higher in antioxidant content. Then also too, you want to look at supporting like glutathione production. So things like N-acetylcysteine or glutathione as a supplement itself, um, very, very good to increase this uh, overall kind of, as, sorry, I should take, once again, take a step back. Glutathione is the master antioxidant in the body. Yes. So anything we can do to produce extra glutathione to help eradicate free radicals, toxins, pollutants, chemicals, that will support liver function and then once again help to balance out the, the protein markers. Um, also something like uh, Tudka, don't ask me pr to pronounce the word itself of what Tudka is. <laughs> Tudka, some form of acid. Um, once again, will help to support this at a biochemical level to support function and natural production uh, of these proteins within the liver. Okay, great. So let's move on to the next chapter again. So let's talk about lipids. So lipids are really controversial at the moment, specifically cortisol in 
um, in cardiology. So what's your stance on how blood lipids, specifically cortisol, are, not cortisol, sorry, cholesterol, are seen in our typical allopathic medicine model? Okay, so this is a rant for a completely different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we can do one specifically on cholesterol. I'd love to do that. <laughs> one, thing, one thing I started doing, so I'm, I'm based in Melbourne and I started working out of um, a facility down in Bo Morris, which is a rather larger kind of elderly population. Yep. So I'm working with, down there specifically, I'm there a couple of days a week, and I'm working with a lot of 50 plus kind of clientele. Yep. Now, cholesterol is a big topic of discussion down there because every single one of them has got their GP pushing them to go on statins. My recommendation <laughs> is oh. you right the hell away from those things because they do nothing but harm. And if you really dig into the studies, the incidence of actual benefit is less than 1%. Less than 1% people. And I think statins make one, they are a money pig for the pharmaceutical industry. They make a huge amount of money for the pharmaceutical industry and they absolutely do not help. Because once you're on them, you're on them for the doctor, once you're on them for the rest of your life, mm. you can imagine the profit that comes from that. Effectively, what they do, they strip your body of coenzyme Q10, they deplete energy levels, they damage muscle tissue. The heart itself is a muscle. We're damaging the heart by taking statins. Yeah. All they're basically doing is suppressing the body's natural cycle of cholesterol, which actually, if we talk about cholesterol itself, is super, super essential for the production of all our steroid-based hormones. So we're talking estrogen, testosterone, cortisol, DHEA, which is our youth hormone, aldosterone, which is super essential for uh, fluid balance or hydration within the body. Now, if you have lowered levels of cholesterol, you cannot produce these hormones. So when you start taking statins or you're naturally trying to suppress cholesterol levels, your energy levels, your sex, uh, your libido, your sexual function is going to be massively impaired. Mm -hmm. So I'm of the belief with a lot of the research that I've done that the body will naturally produce enough cholesterol with sufficient, obviously, dietary intake to support its own needs. For example, one of the big reasons with um, from when we look specifically at LDL cholesterol, which is known as the bad cholesterol, it's not bad. It's actually really, really good. But it's one of the big markers they look at it from a GP's perspective when they put someone on a statin. So I'm just going to interject really quickly. So what is the medicine level of what, what overall cholesterol level you should have and LDL and HDL? And what do you recommend is healthy in blood work? So in terms of total cholesterol, medical ranges are generally between, I think they're between three and a half and five. They, they vary between labs. Yeah. Um, but generally most GPs want low cholesterol. They generally want it below four and a half. Now, the ranges that I look at, generally somewhere between four and a half to six and a half. So I want it on the high level of the equation. Now, a little bit higher than that is not the end of the world, especially if you made significant dietary changes. Like, for example, when you increase the amount of proteins and fats in someone's diet, from a cholesterol perspective, you generally see an uptick in total cholesterol. And then they go... So what tends to happen is like if I work with a client, we increase their diet, uh, increase total cholesterol from a dietary perspective, they get their bloods done, their cholesterol is even higher than what it once was. Even though, and what happens then is the GP sees themselves and they're like, oh no, you have to go on a statin. Now this is with clients that are 25, 30, 35, 40, who have in the previous months of kind of changing their diet, have lost weight, increased energy, look healthier, performing better, <laughs> but of course, because that one number on that one blood test has gone up, you've got to go on a statin. And it's like, no, no, it's just the body adapting to increases in dietary cholesterol and it eventually balances out over time. Yeah. So I naturally want high levels of cholesterol because once again, as we mentioned before, it's super essential production of all our essential hormones that keep us young and fertile and virile, I guess. Mm. Um, so from a vitality perspective, cholesterol is essential. Um, yeah, and when I was just said before, when I was talking about LDL cholesterol, like LDL cholesterol is utilized, it's produced within the liver and is recycled by the liver. Yeah. The issue with cholesterol is when cholesterol, specifically LDL cholesterol, becomes oxidized from poor lifestyle choices. So we're talking alcohol, medicinal usage, poor diet, sugar, you know, saturated nasty fats, those types of things. What that does to LDL cholesterol, it becomes oxidized. Now, it's oxidized LDL that is the issue. That's the stuff that can cause inflammation, can lead to plaquing within the arteries. So 
it's not a cholesterol issue, it's a dietary issue. Because mm-hmm. when cholesterol, LDL, cholesterol becomes oxidized, it cannot be recycled by the liver, which is what leads to the, the clogging of the arteries, etc. So effectively, what we want to do is ensure that that uh, LDL cholesterol doesn't become oxidized by one, ensuring we're eating a quality diet and eliminating as much toxicity as possible, but also including things like antioxidants in our diet to help remove these free radicals to prevent the oxidization of cholesterol before it becomes nasty. Mm. You take a stat and you're effectively just blocking cholesterol at the source yep. when we actually do need it. Mm-hmm. The issue is the lifestyle choices of what we're putting into our body. Mm. Ah, thank you. (laughs) We will do a whole other podcast on cholesterol because I was vegan for a long time. And that was something that that's something that, you know, the vegan science world talks about a lot is cholesterol and how deadly it is. And it wasn't until I started eating meat again and actually started feeling better. And I didn't lose weight, but I felt more I felt more vital and I felt like my skin was better. And then I found out that cholesterol is absolutely essential. And I feel like I was completely hoodwinked. I think for the most part, most of modern society has been hoodwinked. Um, And there's lots of weird science out there around cholesterol i mean i think we could talk probably do a whole podcast in the future just about that we could talk about that forever another controversy is iron (laughs) so there's so much bad information on iron circulating at the moment what is your perspective on why so many women have low iron levels and what can we do about it so i knew this one was coming (laughs) Uh, we we get asked this all the time Uh, now effectively Iron is critical for our health. Yeah. Energy production, red cell production. Um, the problem is we're finding, and I'd say a large, not a large majority, but I'd say a majority of women that I test, especially pre-menopausal women, um, when we run their iron tests, and they might have high levels of iron or sufficient levels of iron in the blood, but they're generally depleted in ferritin, which is effectively stored iron. Yes. So basically they do have some iron in their body, but they're not storing any. Their reserves are all but gone. So effectively, if you think of it from that perspective, if you don't have a piece of red meat or intake any kind of dietary iron sources for a couple of days and you've got no stores, this is obviously going to feel or explain why you're so, you're feeling so depleted, so crashed because the body's got nothing left. Mm. So regarding kind of as to why this is, uh, there's a couple of factors that are at play. Um, the obvious one is dietary intake. So if women are not consuming enough high iron-based foods, so specifically iron protein, uh, sorry, animal proteins, because once again, animal proteins, minerals, nutrients, vitamins, iron are going to be far greater or far more efficiently absorbed from animal proteins than it is from plant sources. Mm-hmm. So that's why consuming proteins within your diet becomes super essential. Now, this whole analogy of only eating red meat twice a week, I honestly believe is absolute bollocks Yeah. Uh, because it, they recently came out and kind of disproved this with a study that what they were doing, the studies that were saying that red meat is bad and you should have it twice a week, basically included every single processed food or processed red meat in the study. They never separated a piece of steak from a piece of salami. So yeah, you guys are smart enough to work out the difference between the two. Yeah. Um, but I guess one of the other factors relative to one of the reasons why women have low iron, obviously, or probably two, two parts I should mention, obviously, a woman that's got a healthy menstrual cycle, she's going to be losing iron when she when she goes through a bleed. Mm. Like that's a given. That's why generally you'll find, especially you'll see it in the book, like the ranges that I've got for ferritin levels between men and women are different. You know, I expect men to have higher levels of ferritin because we don't have a cycle, we don't have a cyclical bleed. Whereas women, obviously when they bleed every month, they are losing a little bit of iron in their blood. Mm. But also I guess one of the big factors that we look at, and this is uh, relevant to men and women, is from a microbiome perspective. If your gut health is impaired, your body's capacity to break down foods, if your microbiome is imbalanced, you don't have the right bacteria that actually can synthesize iron within the gut, then obviously you're going to be low iron. But then also from a structural standpoint, if you've got damage or intestinal permeability, damage to the cells in your gut, your capacity to absorb iron is going to be impaired as well. Further to that, if you're consuming low levels of vitamin D, uh, sorry, vitamin C, Vitamin C is required to uptake iron within the cells. So gastrointestinal, from a gastrointestinal perspective, that is critical when it comes to iron levels within the body. And we will circle back to that in a few questions because, yeah, I would like to talk about iron infusions and leaky gut. So do you recommend, first of all, iron infusions and supplementation of iron? 
Okay, so two different answers. Iron infusions, no. Um, the simple premise is uh, whilst it will get a lot of iron into the body very quickly, honestly, you will feel better. Um, the amount of people that I've spoken to that get an iron infusion, they do feel better afterwards because all of a sudden they've gone from having nothing to having quite a bit. So there's going to be a natural uptick in terms of energy and how they feel. The knock-on effect, however, is much more significant. So basically what happens is when you have an iron infusion, it all bypasses the gut. So effectively you're just pumping it into the blood. So you're, effective, you're effectively you're just, you're kind of, it's just a Band-Aid solution. Yep. But also to when they're putting iron, when you're having an iron infusion, the levels of iron that are going into your blood are well above what the body can actually deal with and tolerate. So the body will take some of it and you'll feel a little bit more energetic, but what happens to the leftover, the excess iron that's now in the blood? Now, effectively, that's going to lead to oxidative stress. It's going to lead to something called lipid peroxidation, which is basically the damaging of the cells within the body which is then further going to lead to increased levels of inflammation. Now, that's going to impair circulation, energy transportation, nutrient uptake and circular, uh, uh, transportation as well. So the knock-on effect of having an iron infusion is quite significant yes. simply because the body's dealing with high levels of iron that it should not be dealing with or have in its system at one time. It's a toxicity risk. Yep. It really is. Yep. So could iron infusions lead to leaky gut? Indirectly, yes. Yeah. So all those things that I mentioned before, like if you thought about, if you were to pump all that iron to the gut, that's going to do significant damage to the gut lining. However, because it goes in the bloodstream, all those responses that I mentioned before, you know, oxidative stress, uh, damage to cell integrity, as a byproduct, as it circulates around the system, is going to come back and damage the, uh, the gut at a cellular level because the body can't utilise all the iron that's been absorbed in that or been infused, so it recirculates. It's so awful because women have low iron and then they go to their GP and they're just like, okay, take a supplement. And I have so many problems with ferritin, like taking iron ferritin for gut health because I think there's certain like microbiome in, in our microbiome. There's certain bacteria, yeast and fungi that feed on ferritin, right? And it could feed the bad bacteria. So we could put, probably talk about that. But these iron infusions, I, ju I, I see more harm than good overall. So thank you for explaining that. I, I just don't see... It's a short-term solution, but at a cost. Yeah. And that's very much a lot of the stuff that we deal with from a medical perspective. That's kind of how it works. Um, I mean, when we, we speak specifically about supplementation, for example, with iron, like I'm not against it, but I do tend to steer away from it unless it's like really severe or someone's running a vegetarian vegan diet and they're not willing to shift towards, um, towards animal proteins or to try and get it from food sources. Um, and generally with that instance, one of the things that we need to be aware of is when we supplement with iron, when we have elevated levels of iron in the body, it releases something called hepcidin, which effectively blocks the absorption of excess iron. So if you're consistently iron supplementing, sorry, supplementing with iron on a daily basis, you're just elevating this hepcidin level, which yeah. is in turn impacting your ability to actually absorb iron. So once again, you end up with increased levels of iron circulating through the system. Wow. Now, one of the ways to counteract this is to basically you could supplement your iron every second day, which is one thing that I'll do with these specific clients. But in terms of supplementation, like we go back to the gut now, there's a, actually a really good company out there that makes specialised probiotics, and we won't plug them, but they're out there. Um, no, you can actually, plug them. Um, like for example, there's a company called Advanced Probiotics, which I came across a couple of years ago. I have to credit one of my um, friends who kind of brought it to my attention and they do make specific supplements that are designed to support the bacteria to support specific conditions so whether that's something like eczema uh, IBS um, even iron so there's a specific probiotic strain that they utilize in their iron probiotic which will help to produce more of the bacteria that will produce more iron within that is fascinating and what's the name again sorry uh, Advanced Probiotics is a company. Okay, I think cool. the, the supplement itself is Probio, uh, sorry, Biome Iron Plus is the actual probiotic. It is a practitioner product um, and for good reason. Like, you know, you don't want to be taking these just on a whim. You want to be consulting with someone that knows what they're talking about. But that's what I've kind of led towards. I've shifted away from supplementing with probiotics, uh, sorry, with iron supplementation and shifting more to the probiotic form 
because we're actually going to correct it at a at a more kind of at a base level is probably the word I was looking for. Well, it sounds like you're healing an iron deficiency problem and an iron uptake problem holistically. You're going, okay, we don't have iron in the body. Let's give your let's give more dietary iron and more supplementation. Let's only take it twice a day or like twice every second day. And then let's also give you the pro- probiotics to support the uptake of this in the gut as well. I think how you're dealing with all of that is quite beautiful. And I think that's how we should be doing it as opposed to just slapping on a huge iron infusion, which causes all of this fallout later on. This episode is proudly sponsored by Drift Surf Co. They offer non-toxic, ethically made and hand-drawn rugs and yoga mats. And if you've seen me on my socials, you have probably seen one of the three mats I have by them and one yoga mat I have by them. I absolutely back these guys. Annette is one of the owners and she does all of the art as she practices her Buddhist meditations. And so it's incredible when you're on these rugs and on these yoga mats, you can feel the love that have been pressed into these. They're made ethically, they're all non-tox. And if you want, you can go to their website, driftsurfco.org, and you can use Woman 10 for an exclusive 10% off any Drift Surf Curl product. Um, so let's move on <laughs> to some minerals so the one of the last chapters of your book or the last chapter of your book actually goes into minerals and this is something i talk about a lot with women because generally we see that minerals are quite depleted in women and we need high minerals in women because we're producing all these different sex hormones all the time so what are some common themes you see in a modern woman's blood plan regarding mineral balances and i know this is quite a broad question so you might actually my question is would you see high copper in women with estrogen dominance would you see low magnesium in someone who was just giving birth like could you give us just some ballpark figures for if someone went out and got a blood test if they had low or high of these minerals the minerals that you talk about in your book what can we talk about what that actually means and how to take this apart and how to understand this blood work yeah we can we can break this down a little bit um because it's quite important and when it comes to getting your bloods tested these are some of the harder ones to get the gps to run you know, one of the tricks that I tell them is I tell them that if they're working with me, I say you're working with a nutritionist, even though I'm a naturopath, um, because we're specifically looking at it from a dietary perspective. Now, across the board, um, magnesium is a big, big issue for both sexes, but especially for women. Um, now, magnesium is one of the most essential minerals that we can be, we need to consume um, on a daily basis. The problem is getting magnesium from food sources these days is becoming more and more difficult because magnesium used to be very, very rich and dense in the soil, which would grow into the, all the produce that we'd eat, you know, whether it's fruits and vegetables or whether it's even just like cows that would eat the grass, which had magnesium, which we'd eat then in turn eat the cows. Yes. Um, magnesium in high levels of stress, it's basically the one mineral that really kind of helps to fight or buffer cortisol. So when you become highly, highly stressed, the body needs more magnesium. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're highly stressed but you've got no magnesium going in, then all of a sudden stress is going to run rampant through the system. Now, I think you mentioned before in terms of stress tolerance, especially to women, the, uh, the reality is women don't have the same level of stress tolerance that men do. From a biochemical perspective, it becomes very, very obvious. So... Magnesium for most women is I pretty much with pretty much every woman that I deal with that is stressed, which is pretty much every woman. Yeah. You know, magnesium supplementation is super essential because it helps to calm the body down, not just at a muscular level, because everyone knows magnesium is good for muscle cramps, but also from a mental perspective, it helps to calm the brain down. So for those that can kind of tend towards the uh, little bit anxious side of the equation, yeah, magnesium is really, really good for that. Um also, too, for example, like zinc and B vitamins, you know, especially women that consume low-protein diets or no-protein diets, yep. you know, B vitamins and zinc, zinc are found in the highest forms, generally in animal proteins. Uh, they're really, really essential from... B vitamins are essential for energy production, for stress tolerance. Zinc is super essential for, super essential for immune function. Yes. Now, in a stress state, these things become massively depleted. So... They're kind of common trends that I'll see specifically. Really, zinc um, and B vitamins are probably zinc, magnesium, and B vitamins are ones that I see, especially B12, um, chronically low in a lot of women. 
And like these can be corrected quite easily from a nutritional standpoint. Yeah. But if you've been in that stress state or you've been doing, you know, you've been working too hard, grinding or let's say burning the candle at both ends for a long period of time, like we just deplete our bodies of all this stuff. And this is why we feel so tired and fatigued. Yes. Yeah. You can give most people a B vitamin and all of a sudden they'll feel a kick in energy like two days later. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And what would you recommend that women do to boost mineral levels if they don't want to eat animal protein? Would you suggest something like shilajit or like what would your recommendation be? Um, yeah. So shilajit, something like that will definitely help. Um, you know, depending on if they're willing to use, for example, there's some really good organ-based supplementation. So if they don't want to eat, mil- uh, eat meat but they're willing to take animal-based supplementation, mm. that's another way they can go about it. In those instances, though, that, that's where, especially if they're not willing to shift away from the vegetarian or vegan lifestyle, which, you know, I can understand, especially from a from certain aspects, if it's a health aspect, I kind of start to, you know, I'll start to... But the ethical component, if you don't know where your meat is coming from, I feel like we're both very lucky because we, we circulate in these health fields. I live in fucking Tasmania, so I can get really good meat wherever I am. This is the place of milk and honey, so it's not an issue. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, for the most part, people who are vegan and vegetarian don't live out in the country where they have access to good meat. And if they didn't want to move away from that, would you recommend synthetic vitamins for this and minerals for this? Or what would you... Generally, these are the cases, as we mentioned before, specifically like with the iron, it's a case like this where I would recommend supplementation and it would have to be long-term. Okay. You know, taking one bottle of B vitamins is not going to boost your B12 and your B6 and your folate back to the healthy levels. You know, if you're not consuming it and you're living a life in today's world, which is a very stressful existence, like you're going to be constantly depleting yourself. So for vegetarians and vegans, the reality is, and I'm sure most of them are aware of it, like long-term supplementation or something like a B12, like a zinc, it it just has to exist. Otherwise, they're just going to be chronically chasing their own tail and they're just not going to get the best out of themselves at all. So those synthetic vitamins can be used. and They're not optimal and I do agree with you and I like how you went, okay, Will they, will they eat meat? Okay, no. Will they eat organ meats? Which we could also do another whole conversation on organ meats because I think they are so fantastic and so bioavailable. And if you don't feel open to eating that, okay, then syn- synthetic vitamins are the next best thing. Not the most amazing choice, but do you, feel like, do, you, do you feel like they have any negative consequences in the body for bioavailability over the long term because they're not optimal, at least how I see it? What's your perspective on synthetic vitamins and minerals? Yeah, uh, especially the, the synthetic stuff. Yes, uh, 100% there's issues with bioavailability. Yeah. Uh, the quality is super, super essential. You know, if you walk into Woolies and there's a special for 50% off their entire range of supplements and they're already cheap $20 bottles as it is, yeah, there's a reason why they're so cheap. Um, so, like, in general, it's probably relative just to kind of touch base on supplementation in general. Like, I'm a huge advocate for supplementation to restore balance within the body. Now, once we've got that balance and we've got these levels back up to where they need to be, that's when it becomes less essential. Theoretically, we should be able to get the majority of what we need from nutritional. Yep. But that takes time. So that's where, you know, for example, if I'm working with a client and trying to build up their B12 levels, okay, one, we need to get them eating more animal proteins, but two, will it help to get their levels up higher quicker with a quality B12? Yes, it will. So you might run a couple of bottles of that whilst they're kind of working on their nutrition. Um, but, yeah, relative to that, like, I, I, I'm not – I kind of – it's the lesser of many evils. So in terms of working with synthetic vitamins, yes, I will work with them, but they're not ideal. I'd rather be getting it from nutritional standpoints, but also to, like I said, not everything is created equal. You know, there's some really good quality brands out there that I use a lot of. For example, um, Thorn is probably – Thorn Research is probably my favourite company. Yeah. Um, in terms of supplementation, the amount of research they do um, compared to all the other companies out there is next level. Um, and their supplements work. I've been using them for, for years now. Um, so, yeah, it's a, a thorn research. You know, you might pay $40 for a B vitamin there versus a $20 Swiss B vitamin. Like, it's the same as food quality. Yeah. An organic piece of steak versus a conventionally grown piece of steak from Woolworths, it's like... Mm. Yeah, and I think we just need to start prioritizing health and it is more expensive and it is an investment and you're and you're worth it. That's what I always tell women in my in my sessions that you're absolutely worth a forty dollar bottle of vitamins. If you and it's not a band like we're using this as a band aid, this is not a full on solution. I think in vegan vegetarian people 
synthetic vitamins are going to be a long-term solution and it's better than nothing and that's okay. And this is where personalized nutrition is really important because everyone is so different. Um, okay, so thank you for that. So what do you commonly see in women with minerals and in their blood work on hormonal birth control? And I keep bringing back to hormonal birth control because women are really interested in how this is affecting their mineral levels in their blood. I see this all the time. I see really depleted minerals and it changes all the time. What do you usually see and what do you think are some fixes for that? Um, well, effectively, as you just mentioned, like you're going to see depleted levels of just minerals in general, especially B vitamins. Um and as we mentioned before, because B vitamins are so essential for energy production, but also for regulating stress levels, like hormonal birth control, like you know, I'm not the expert in women's health, but I work with a lot of women. I, uh, Marie, do I work with, like I said, brilliant when it comes to this stuff, working with yourself as well. Like when women are on hormonal birth control, it just messes with the body on so many levels. And a lot of it, when you strip it back to the biochemical standpoint, when it's robbing the body of minerals and nutrients that you're consuming, then effectively, of course, it's going to have negative implications moving forward. Like, and especially from a fertility standpoint, like, yes. because if you're missing these essential minerals that are required for hormone production, that's going to lead to uh, issues that are kind of, like I said, with sex hormones that are fit and from a fertility perspective. So I, I really can't advocate enough for women to kind of get away from hormonal birth control. Yes. You know, there are, as you, you know this is your jam. Uh, <laughs> like in terms of kind of what they can do about it, like I said, like your work is fantastic. And that's why, you know, I, I definitely send women your way when, especially down in Tasmania. Um, so from that perspective, I really think that we need to look at it from a, when you look at it from a biochemical level, if the body is depleted, how is it supposed to function properly? Mm what is causing this depletion? Is it because you're not consuming enough of what you need and or because you're taking hormonal birth control or you're on that medication that's robbing your body of these minerals and nutrients? Like the body just won't be able to function without it. Yes. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so how does hormonal birth control impact women's circulating calcium levels? Uh, now, this is an interesting one because hormonal birth control, I, I have looked into this briefly before and from what I understand, it doesn't really impact calcium levels on a negative, in a negative way. If anything, it's been shown to have a moderate intake or moderate increase. But the knock-on from that is what hormonal birth control will impact at the calcium level is the capacity to absorb and metabolize all these minerals and nutrients. As we mentioned, when we're taking hormonal birth control, it robs minerals and nutrients from the body which can lead to cellular damage and impaired mineral nutrient uptake. So from that level, um, that's how I look at it. it. It's very much, will it impact calcium levels? Not negatively, but is it impacting at a indirectly at a, another level? Definitely so. Okay, great. All right, and just to finish up, one of the last questions. So we're touching on a few different things that are quite controversial and like picking up lots of steam in the sphere at the moment. And one of them is copper toxicity. So copper toxicity is having a moment. Can you please speak to its optimal levels and how much too little or too much can impact a female body? Yeah, so copper toxicity, you're right. It's like it's a big one kind of in today's, today's realm. Um, we're seeing more and more of it, um, you know, especially – Funnily enough, those who live out in Western Australia where the soil copper levels is quite high, mm. you tend to find people with higher copper levels and soil, obviously, sorry, out in WA, just because they're consuming more copper-based or copper, sorry, foods grown in more copper-dense soil. Um, but also, too, when it comes to hormonal birth control, we all know copper is used quite commonly in this stuff. Yes. And from a, from with the way that I look at it, it's, it's a difficult one to get GPs to test, to be honest with you. So it's not something you really kind of need to go in there and ask. You know, if you're on birth control, 100% mentioned, look, I'm on birth control. I'm a little bit worried about my copper levels and the, how this might be impacting my body. Can we check copper? And you'd like to think they do that if, they're, if you're working with a good GP. But, I mean, optimal range is generally, I like them to be between 16 and 18. And the, the crazy part is the medical realm looks at it between 13 and 22. So they're very, very broad ranges. Um we both know that uh, excess copper levels or impaired copper levels can impact the menstrual cycle. It will have an impact on fertility and pregnancies. Also, too, copper is essential for the synthesis of uh, thyroid hormones. Now, when we're talking about metabolism, energy production, weight management, like it can have 
if copper is impacting thyroid function, then that's going to have the knock-on effect that's going to have impact, you know, weight management, energy. Like these are super, super essential for, for women's health and health in general. Mm. Um, one of the other things that I talk about um, and I've got dabbled into a little bit is it's not just essential that copper is in the right levels, but also there's something when we look at uh, zinc and copper together, so the ratio between the two and the impact on mental health. Like if you have an imbalance and there's been countless studies done on zinc and copper ratios, um, I'm pretty sure there was a study that I came across years ago relative to they tested inmates um, and their mental health relative to copper and uh, zinc levels relative to episodes of psychosis and depression. And they found that when the balance was out of whack, like they tended to lean more one way than the other. So, Sorry, like, just to go back a little bit. So higher copper and low zinc was associated with psychiatric disorders in inmates, prison inmates in this, in this study. Yeah, um, low levels of cop. Uh, sorry, low levels of zinc, high levels of copper were shown to lead to more incidents of anxiety, depression, mood disorders, uh, mental impairment. So, this is where we go back to that what we mentioned before. Like, and I, I want to emphasize, especially you know, if you are looking at my book and you're looking at one page, it's not a good idea to sit there and say, "Oh, low copper, take X, Y, and Z." You need to kind of sit there and go, okay, what are the trends throughout my entire blood work that I'm kind of picking up from, you know, whether it's copper, is my zinc levels sufficient? Okay, copper and zinc's fine. Okay, I can move on to the next. Mm -hmm. Or maybe my copper level's good, but my zinc level's low. That means also the ratio, the, the zinc to copper ratio is going to be out. So that could be potentially impacting my mental health. Interesting. So we need to kind of look at it. We can't just look at one marker and sit there and say, that's the problem why I'm not feeling great. Yeah. It's an overall sum of everything combined that we start to see trends when these when things are out of balance that actually dictate kind of how we're feeling and can lead to disease and illness or even just like fatigue and just not performing at your best. Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was incredible. Was there anything else you wanted to say before you finish up? Can you please tell people where to find you, where to buy the book and more about your partner in crime who wrote this book with you as well? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so I'm based in Melbourne. So I work out of uh, two facilities at the minute. I work in Albert Park out of a place called Freya Health. Um, I'm in Beau Morris at a place called Core Foundations. I kind of split my time between the two and also consult online, obviously. You can find me, my website is andylucas.com.au. If you are interested in purchasing the book, you can buy it through that website. I'm going to run a 20% discount for anyone that purchases the book. Simply use the code ARCWOMAN ah. in the checkout. And that will entitle you to 20% off, um, whether that's the, the hard copy or the ebook. Um, like regarding that, like I think the book itself was originally we had the intention of kind of designing for, you know, for students, for practitioners that wanted a little bit more assistance. But what we found is a lot of people that are just health conscious that are kind of want to take control of their own health will find this really useful. I mean, it, it's written in... Um, very easy to understand. It's broken down into simple language. There's no kind of heavy medical jargon or anything like that in there. And, you know, Sarah will put some screenshots or share some screenshots of what's actually inside the book so you can see what it's about. But I think in terms of kind of moving forward, the initial book kind of covers off the, the markers that Sarah and I kind of spoke about today. We're in the process of writing a second copy, which is going to deep dive into thyroid hormones, sex hormones, some of the more obscure tests that are a bit more specialised, I guess. Um, because we've just found it's, we've had an overwhelming response of people that have uh, got the book. They, they've just found it incredibly helpful. And we sit there and say, look, you know, we want to get as much of this information out to the population as we can, because especially in today's time, we all, we're all learning that, you know, what we're being told in regards to health and wellbeing is not serving us. And we really need to kind of take control of our own health. And the more information we have at our disposal, the better we can be. Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that discount code for everyone and I hope everyone uses it. Thank you. No, you're more than welcome. Um, yeah, it's always lovely to chat, Sarah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We could go for hours on anything and everything. Oh, yeah. I think maybe I'll have you and I'll have Dr. Miranda Miles on with you as well when you release your second book, which will be in March. Is that correct? We're aiming, we're aiming to get it to the end of March, start of April. Okay, no pressure. I'm just... <laughs> That, that is the goal. Um, this year, as you can imagine, is like you, as we discussed earlier, is getting busy fast. Yes. So, um, but we really want to try and get this out as soon as possible because 
we, we just think like this type of information, there's just not enough of it out there. No, and not. in a world today where we've got information at our fingertips, you know, one person says this, one person says this, another person says this, we don't really know what to make of it. So if we can kind of bring it all together in one kind of resource, um, it, it really kind of helps to make things a little bit easier for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I was quite young, I was quite obsessed with Buddhism. <laughs> this will connect. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this um, this story, this parable of these four monks who were all blind and they all found an elephant and they all had a different part of its body. One had its trunk, one had its tail, one had its foot and one had an ear. And they're all explaining what this animal was and they're all fighting over what it was. And really everything everyone was saying was true, but it was all different parts of the same animal. And I think that's what we're seeing in nutritional science at the moment. And I think that's why your book is so fundamental for practitioners and even individual use is because it makes it makes sense of this elephant in the room that we all have and it can help us understand what problem actually is going on and what the root cause actually is and how to solve this problem yeah cool well thank you so much we'll have you on soon yeah great to